Now, crossing the Atlantic, we've just mentioned it, with four engines seems fair enough, but I'm guessing doing it on only one engine tends to concentrate the mind a little. It does a little bit, yes. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a memorable experience, I'd say. Um, as I, I mentioned in my book, that uh, the, it, was a, it was a very memorable trip, not least the fact that after an hour's flying, after having a, quite a lot of faffing around trying to find out which tanker we were supposed to be crossing the Atlantic with, because East Anglia was just covered in tankers at the time. We took off from Wittering on the Eastly uh, runway, and uh, there were just Victor tankers everywhere. And I was uh, number two to a guy called Chris Bain, a very experienced guy, and uh, we eventually got sorted out with the right tanker. And then we sort of set off across uh, Turn West, uh, heading towards Goose Bay. And I thought, oh, right, now we can relax. And I looked down the side of the cockpit and we were just coasting in on the east coast of Scotland at that point. And I thought we've had an hour and we've got nowhere. You know. But even so, it only took us about five and a half hours to get to Goose Bay from takeoff at Wittering. The Guatemalan Air Force aircraft you might have faced in Belize mm. uh, was the Cessna A-37 Dragonfly. Yeah. How do you reckon you'd have fared against it? I think it would have been very interesting, actually, um, because it's not the fastest of aircraft. And, you know, we, we could operate down to their speed range if we needed to close in for a gun's kill. The problem is that we didn't know where the bullets were going. And uh, the, though we had a gun sight, of course, in the aircraft, it had never been calibrated. And though quite a lot of work was done before we reinforced Belize, we still hadn't really got an aiming solution. So I think that would have been quite interesting. I think, in all honesty, our presence was the thing that counted because once the Harriers arrived, uh, the Guatemalans backed off completely. And it wasn't just the Harriers, of course, it was also the British Army reinforced as well. So there was a lot of reinforcement going in there. Um, but suddenly, of course, nothing happened. After your shortened tour with one squadron, you were sent back to instructional duties, mm. albeit um, on the Harrier ACU, you mentioned a few hundred yards up the road. Yeah. Were you disappointed to leave the front line? I was very frustrated, yes. Yeah. I mean, you ask about going to be an instructor on your first tour, I could live with that, that was fine. But I really didn't want to get back into instructional duties after only two years on the front line. So that yes, it was frustrating. Um, there was compensation. It was an interesting job. Um, there is no doubt that teaching people to fly the Harrier is a demanding job. Uh, uh, everything can go wrong very, very quickly in a Harrier, um, as people will probably appreciate with the nozzle lever and the throttle next to each other. If you get them confused, as people may well do when they're very early on the aircraft, everything can go wrong very quickly. So it's a demanding job. Um, I, I have to admit, during that tour, I did sort of flirt with the idea of leaving the Air Force at that time. And in fact, a lot of the instructors on the OCU at the time were doing just that. They'd done their time and they thought, right, it's time to go and earn some money and join the airlines. So I was surrounded by people who were following that course. I certainly thought about it. Um, I didn't get very far apart from getting the notes to study with. I didn't get very far into them. And then other things happened, like I was getting married. Um, I was... Uh, selected to be a display pilot for my last year on the OCU and then of course I found out I was getting promoted so everything sort of took over and I just went you know what operational tour out in Germany let's go for it and that's what I did. In your book you describe what it was like taking off from a semi-prepared dispersal site pretty exciting stuff it always seems to me that a rough field might not have been the best spot, whereas a metalled road, perhaps an autobahn junction, might have served better. Mm. Where would you have gone in a real conflict? Um, on the surface, a road and all the, <coughs> excuse me, the war sites had already been um, surveyed. Um, we had a Harrier Plans Office out at RAF Guttersloe and their responsibility was to make sure that we had sites ready to go to in war and not just sites but backup sites as well so if we had to move. Now I didn't know too much about it, I did go on one site's visit even though I finished up as Deputy Squadron Commander. The information was kept under um, close tabs um, and very few people knew much about it. I went out on one site's visit uh, with Keith Grumbly who was running the Harrier Plans uh, office at the time and we did go out and have a look at one site um, and, and they were basically um, 
gave us the ability to operate off a hard surface, you know, a good bit of road with open clear area. Not that we needed an awful amount, to be honest, um, but then perhaps a big factory site with parking where you could put your aircraft undercover inside a factory. Yeah, like Amazon that. Warehouse had they existed. Indeed. Absolutely, <laughs> you can get a few squadrons in one of those, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, you talk of your engine failure and mm. ejection uh, over Germany in a way that takes us all through the drama of the event. Perhaps you could recount a little of that for us. And I'm curious, was the cause ever established? Um, right, let's start with the cause. The cause was that um, a few flying hours previously, the engineers had carried out a repair on the intake of the aircraft. and. When they do the repair, they've used rivets um, to put the metal back together again. And when you use a rivet gun, there is a bit of dispensed metal uh, that's fired out from the gun. And that bit of metal is caught in a bag, which is attached to the gun. Now, the right bags had gone in short supply, and the site didn't have the right bag. So what they'd done was they got a plastic bag and they'd taped it up, and they were using that. And overuse, one of the corners of the bag had got frayed, and so the hot rivet mandrel, the bit of the hot rivet that's left, had fallen out into the intake. And then when the aircraft flew next, that hot rivet mandrel had gone through the engine and it had impinged on the blades uh, of the engine. Now, it didn't cause the failure straight away, but what it did do was make a nick in one of the turbine blades so that some flying hours later, I think it was about five and a half hours flying later, I was the lucky man that happened to be sitting on the aircraft where that blade failed and it just destroyed the turbine. So at that point, the engine was never going to produce any thrust again. So that, that was the cause of the accident. So it was interesting enough, like a, a number of accidents, it, there was a whole chain of events there, like the right bag wasn't there, uh, they made do, they'd used another bag that had dropped something into the um, intake. They hadn't picked it up when they'd done the clean up afterwards. And so ultimately the end, it, that led to an engine failure and the loss of a Harrier GR3 worth about seven million pounds in those days. So I was the guy sitting in the aircraft when it happened. As far as I was concerned, the, it was fairly straightforward for me. I was flying around in northern Germany visibility was not very good. I had a number two following me. We were just about to do an attack run under forward air control uh, on a simulated target. And I was just turning towards the initial point for the run into the target when there was a couple of fairly um, loud or well felt thumps through the airframe. And I thought, that doesn't feel right at all. And he thought, it's not a bird, you know, what could it be? So at that point, I was something is not right. So I just rolled the wings level, climbed up and said to my number two, something wrong, just come and have a look at the airframe, see if you can see any damage or anything. So Les Evans, who was my number two, came up and joined me. And of course, I'm looking in the cockpit, going, there's nothing on the warning panel, the hydraulic system's looking good, the jet pipe temperature's fine, there's absolutely nothing um, wrong here at all. Les comes up alongside and I see him close aboard on one side, goes underneath, comes up the other side, says, all looks okay to me, at which point the engine just failed, just right. as he said that. And uh, so I just suddenly felt a complete loss of thrust accompanied by a lot of heavy rumbling. The whole aircraft was rumbling away and absolutely no thrust from the engine. So at that point, of course, because I lost all thrust, Les got spat out in front of me and I never saw him again. He never saw me again either until I was on the ground. So I converted what speed I had up into height. Uh, I probably got up to about two, two and a half thousand feet maximum and then got into a glide. Well, the Harrier glide, it's 250 knots. It's got very small wings and you come down very fast. So as I say, my book, I was looking at a whole load of ground coming up to meet me very quickly. And uh, so I went into the relight drill for the engine, which is the only thing I could do. It's a drill that we practice all the time in the simulator. It's very straightforward. I just went through the drill, relit the engine, the engine relit, advanced the throttle, absolutely nothing, just deep rumbling. So I shut it down, tried again, absolutely nothing, and thought, well, I'm out of here. So it's a case of, right, quick call on the radio, I'm ejecting, pull the handle, and that was it, I'm on my way. 
and we've got your tie and oh, yeah. caterpillar okay. bash in yeah. front of us to uh, mark the event uh, yeah. and thank the Lord for Martin Baker. Yeah, right? absolutely. Great company. Absolutely. Great company. Brilliant. Um, Follow up question to that, if I mm. may. Uh, like the Harrier, the F 35 Lightning is also a single engined aircraft. In view of your experience, do you think that was a particularly good choice? It's, it's technology, isn't it? It's what you need to carry out the job. And um, I mean, F-35 has been in service for a few years now and they actually have a pretty good record. They lost one off the front of the carrier. I'm still not sure what happened there. Perhaps you know. Uh, uh, I believe they left an intake I th yeah, blank that's... in which got absorbed. Yeah. And that's what I heard, but I don't know yes. whether that's been uh, officially released. I yet, haven't but... seen an official yeah. um, accident report. Yeah. It's a difficult one, that, isn't it? Because, you know, the more you put engines into an aircraft, um, the more weight you're carrying around for a start and the greater complexity as well, and the more risk for anything to go wrong. I mean, we can say, yes, the Harrier had a number of engine failures, but actually that engine kept going in the most dire circumstances at times as well. There's some very good recorded cases of the Harrier, the Pegasus engine coming back with a lot of damage where it just kept going. So... It's always, these things are always a trade-off, aren't they?